Hey guys, how's it going? I want to jump in here real quick. Yeah, I get to record on my computer today. I want to jump in here real quick. I just came from the um, uh, Michael Pearl over at the Door Ministries out in Tennessee. Did an Easter service live stream. Funny enough, he covered uh, a bunch of the same scriptures I covered this morning uh, in daily prayer. Uh, but I wanted to uh, touch on something. And it was something that I've been telling you guys. And I want to cover it here uh, in depth with the scripture. And it was people in the chat were talking about certain things. They were, they were wording everything in code to keep people from understanding where they were really coming from. Uh, because it's their sick way of, of thinking that they're tricking people. And, oh, I got them, even though nobody understands what they're talking about. But I found one guy who was speaking a certain way, and I started calling him out. And I got him to expose himself. And he exposed himself that he doesn't believe the Bible is true, that it has been accurately translated. Now, somebody else jumped in, and this was an individual uh, uh, that I had dealt with a long time ago and had blocked on my channel um, for the, the exact same thing because she wouldn't listen to reason. And she started speaking right at the end of the chat when everything cut off. Um, so, someone who doesn't believe the Bible is accurately translated, will all they'll speak in code because they're trying to hide. Because, it's, first of all, they're cowards. They're scared because they really don't know what they believe in. But they use that as an opportunity to try to start issues with other people. When you bring them out into the open and expose their sin to them, they run and hide. They get scared or they go on the attack. That's what he did. He called me a fool. I called him a heretic. Because if you say that God is a liar by saying his word is not preserved like he said he would preserve it, you're calling him a liar. That makes you a heretic. And so I blocked him and I said, he, we're not to even talk to a person like this. And nobody else responded to him anymore after that. Uh, funny enough, though, is that this is a common misunderstanding of Scripture that people have. Now, let me paint you a picture. Go back um, to the 40s A.D. People were writing all this stuff down. All this stuff was being written. 40s, 50s, 60s, all these letters are being written. All these epistles are being written. Now, because of the way things were back then, they had to hide that, a lot of that stuff. They instantly knew that if any of this stuff gets found, it's going to be destroyed. In fact, a lot of the churches ended up getting sacked, and all their writings were destroyed. So what they would do is they would have people, their job was to sit down and copy it down and make multiple copies of it. And they would pass these copies out, so it would go to as many people as possible, so the area would be saturated with it, so somebody would have a piece of this. Now, at one point, they were tearing scrolls in half and giving pieces to individual people. They would have little chunks of it. But that's what they had to hold on to to preserve these writings. Now, we go back from today and we look back and we have 26,000 plus different scrolls for the different books. Though we don't, in most cases, have the original writings, but some we do, we have a lot of other writings that have been copied. Now, if you take somebody who has made a copy in 40 A.D. and somebody who's made a copy in 140 A.D., pretty good chance they didn't copy from each other because neither one of them would have been alive at the same, life, same time. And here's what's amazing, though. Even being in two different parts of the world, even never having seen each other's work, obviously this one didn't see this one's work, and this one definitely didn't see this one's work, because this one's work might have been destroyed, or it may have been gone somewhere else and gone into hiding. Yet, when they have the two works and compare them, they're a perfect match. How does that happen over that long of a time frame? When they go and they look at these things, what they look for is continuity in the script. When we have, if we have 16 different scrolls that talk about the book of Luke or a copy of the book of Luke, do they match? Where, what time frame do they come from? What are we dealing with here? And so what they'll do is they'll go and they'll, all the ones that match, they move them to a pile. The ones that don't match, they put them over here. Now these have to be examined more. And what they find in most cases is that at some point they've been rewritten. These all match back to the earliest writings. And we have writings literally from the first 100 years. So that's pretty close. Now, again, I've said before, and I'll keep pointing this out, we assume that the writings we have from Plato's and Socrates are from those men, yet the earliest writing we have from Plato, who wrote Socrates' stuff down, is 1,500 years after his death. How do we know that's real? Because we have nothing before that. We have nothing from his lifetime. So how can we prove that's from him? Yet these writings... These people, these copies come from while Paul was still alive, while Peter was still alive, while Luke and Mark and James are all still alive. So it's pretty easy to deduce. This is probably pretty darn accurate. 
Now, if you have a whole big stack of them, it's really easy to tell which one's right and which one's wrong. And what they found when they did all these studies, and they proved all these documentations, and went back to other documentations and proved it even more, what they found was, is that between all of them that matched, the only difference was small grammatical errors. There was one case where they had one writing, I uh, forget what book it was from, it was a New Testament book, and 350 years later, they had a copy of that book, and they both matched perfectly except for minor grammatical errors. The words weren't changed, the story didn't change. Now, you're going to have people that are going to go out of their way to tell you, hey, the Bible has been improperly translated. Cool. Where'd you come to, how'd you come to that conclusion? Well, this guy talked about this, this guy talked about that. But you didn't go prove it to yourself? Well, I mean, I just went off what they said because they, you know, they're, they're experts in that stuff. Did you validate their expertise? Did you make sure? Or are they just somebody who's got a vendetta against God and is talking out their backside? You've got to go prove that thing first. Somebody comes up and says that, where's your proof? I want to see it. And the moment they start to use scripture to prove themselves, that's where you tell them, stop. You're telling me that the Bible can't be trusted because it has not been properly translated, yet you're about to refer me to scripture from that same Bible? That's a problem. Because now you're a hypocrite. You're telling me the book I can't trust, I need to go read quotes of it. Only the scripture you tell me to read, by the way. So now you're telling me you're the one that gets to judge what's true and what isn't. So I see where this is going. You don't like some things in the Bible, so now you're going to find any excuse you can out there from anybody's book or anybody's commentary to say, oh yeah, that was improperly translated. So here's what we have to really go through. Okay, well what about the other guy that believes like you do, but he believes it actually says something completely different? Is he wrong or are you wrong? Because you both can't be right. Well, what about this other 15 people in this church over here who say, yeah, that wasn't improperly translated. We believe it says this. And both, all of them disagree with you. And even within their group, they all disagree. Who's right? How do we tell? Who do we agree with? Here's how we agree. We come to the word of God and say, that's what's the truth. Because that's the only consistency we have. Because no human being can be consistent. You go in and go to, they had a big convention here a bunch of years ago. Flat Earth Convention. Big old place they rented out, bunch of people there, hundred thousand plus people. A lot of people who are round earth believers who believe rightly and properly, who actually have done some research. They went there. Every single one of them that went there, there was uh, a, a several hundred. Every single one of them that went there and walked around independently. They said I could find no two flat earthers that agreed with each other. Well, what that tells me is that's a problem with their understanding. That's a problem with their doctrine of no two of them can agree. Same thing applies here. You get take two people who agree that the Bible's been improperly translated, pin them down on the scriptures they think are improperly translated and what they really mean, and you'll see that no two of them agree with each other. See, they're all liars. They've been deceived. Now, in the grand scheme of things, we have to come to a conclusion. What can I believe? What can I really, really believe? believe. Now, first of all, and we're going to see this, in the, in the book of John, he says at the very beginning, Jesus Christ is the Word. Let's go look, and then we'll start our, our study here real quick. In the beginning was the Word. Notice it's capitalized. That's Jesus Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, if this is the Word, and that's the referencing to the word referencing Christ, then this is the written representation of Christ. Now, what does Jesus say? He says, in the volume of the book, it's written of me. That's this whole book. So this is Christ. This is the word. This is our, our written representation we can read about. How do we know? Well, see, we have tons of writings that talk about Jesus. But we only have one writing right here that tells us about Jesus, explains about him, gets intimate about him. No other writing that exists goes into this detail and this intimacy into the description of who Jesus Christ is. That right there is the one qualifying factor you, you need. You either have faith or you don't. If you don't, good luck, because you're never going to get anywhere. How do I know that that first verse is saying that the word is Jesus? Well, because the very next verse, he was in the beginning with God. Do you call a book a he? No, you don't refer to a book to a he or she. So that was Jesus Christ. He is the word. 
All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. This book was written because of him. He directly influenced the writing of this book. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. So in these four verses, it quantifies this book, saying that this book, this is Jesus Christ. We have the written representation of it. Everybody's like, I want to see Christ. I want to see Christ. Look at your Bible. Read your Bible. That's Christ. When you speak, it's his voice coming out of you. Because this is his word. You have the Spirit of God in you. It's not too hard to figure out. There's no magic to it or anything like that. It's just common sense. Look at it. Now, for the people who don't believe that his word has been properly translated, or people that are on the fence, or people that have been deceived, you have to ask yourself a question. If the Bible is not the word of God, it has been improperly translated, what writing can I trust, or do I just to get to pick and choose what I can trust? If I take the facts about dynamite, old school dynamite, TNT, and the facts tell me it's stable when it's dry and kept and, and not, you know, because it's, it's a little bit impact instable. In Keep it dry and don't drop it or throw it around like it's a pillow. If it gets wet, it will sweat nitroglycerin and it becomes very unstable. Well, I'm going to ignore all those other facts because I don't believe that. I'm just going to take the, okay, I'm just going to be gentle with it because it's TNT and it'll explode. And then that person walks over because they lack the understanding because they refuse to look at it only taking the parts they wanted to take. Hey, TNT blows stuff up. Cool. And they reach into a box that's been sitting in water and the, all the sticks of dynamite have sweated. That's pure nitroglycerin. Literally picking it up and causing the crystalline structure to crack is enough to set it off. And that stick of dynamite will turn you into hamburger. See, they died and were destroyed because they were stupid. Because they decided not to believe the parts they didn't like. They just believe the parts they did like. The same thing happens to people who do this with the Word of God. They sit here and they pick and choose what they want to believe, but they ignore the rest. Or they change it somehow by allegorizing it, theorizing it, idiomizing it, whatever they want to do with it. Or they just say, oh no, we can't trust that part. That was, You can't believe that part. That's not even in the Bible. These people are going to be destroyed because they didn't look at all the warnings about handling the dynamite and they got blown up. Instead of lay, paying attention to what it says and doing exactly what the instructions say. What do the instructions say? Let's go back to Psalm 12. Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, like tried or silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Notice what he does here. You, giving personal ownership to, you shall keep them, O Lord. Not me, not you, him. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. Now that right there is a promise given by God in the Bible. Now if we're going to ignore that promise and say the Bible has been improperly translated, we just called God a liar. We called this man a liar. Oh no, he didn't know what he was talking about. You can't, that was improperly translated. Really? You know we have the original writings of the Psalms from the original Arthur's? They're a perfect match to what we have today. In fact, um, a couple years ago, they found a page from the book of Exodus, Exodus 12 to be more specific. And when it was dated, it was dated to the literal lifetime of Moses. When they translated it, it translated perfectly to our Exodus 12 we have today. Pretty hard to fight for your argument when the proof is already presented. And they're finding more all the time. They have a lot of the original writings now. Stuff that's scary to the secular world because now it proves what they've been trying to disprove all these years. Well, if we have it, well, why don't we trust what we have? But, you know, two verses. We don't have to go by that. We can go by even more. We're going to go get to Hebrews 4.12. We're going to start over here. We are on uh, King James Bible online because I know there's a bunch of King James Bible uh uh, groupies out there. I like the King James too, but you guys are getting yourselves stuck because half of y'all don't even know what the King James says anyway because you don't look it up. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now, you have to ask yourself a question. What word is he talking about? Well, this is Isaiah. Obviously, he's talking about his book. 
we're in the book of Isaiah right now. In fact, uh, in a couple hours, you'll be watching uh, the next video that I p uh, posted, which, funny enough, ties into um, morning prayer. So what word of the Lord do we believe? Okay, what word agrees? So if you take one book out of the Bible and you say, okay, this entire book I think has been properly translated, now you have a focal point. You take every other book in the Bible and compare it to that book and see if they agree. If they agree, all the rest of it's accurate. If one of them disagrees in a single point, the whole book has to be thrown out. Well, here's an amazing thing, because people have been doing this for years that used to say the Bible was improperly translated. They decided what book they thought was properly translated. Ironically, it's the one of the one. It'll be one of the books we have the original writings of. Then they will go back and they will compare all the other books, and find all the points that they agree on. And it turns out all sixty-six books agree with each other. And all the other writings they have, most of them don't. Now, right away, people say, "Well, what about the Book of Enoch?" Well, the Book of Enoch says literally in the Book of Enoch, it is not to be included in the canon. Enoch himself wrote, "It is not to be included in the canon, but to remain separate." because it's for a different group of people to study. The canon stays the canon for a reason. Now, funny enough, how did Enoch know about that? Because Enoch came before all this. Maybe God already knew this was going to happen today. He already knew that there were going to be people that were going to do this. So he already took steps and made sure it was going to work. Now, right away, if the Word of God, if we believe the book of Isaiah is accurate, the Word of God will stand forever. Isaiah now is a liar if you say the Bible's been improperly translated or if God didn't keep his promise and preserve his word. And you're a heretic. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. What words? Only the words of Jesus Christ? So we can take all the other conversation out and throw it in the trash? The rest of the Bible? We can take that out and throw it in the trash? Well, here's a great, awesome discovery is that there's a lot of times where Jesus is talking in the Old Testament specifically. If you bother to read your Bible, you'll see that. So what part are you going to throw out now? What part isn't his word? Here's a big newsflash for everybody. It's all his word because everybody who spoke in the Bible spoke on the inspiration of God. So if you're calling God a liar, you're a heretic. There's condemnation for heretics. Psalms 119.89, lamed. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. If this book is mistranslated, then the book in heaven is mistranslated because everything here is a shadow of what's in heaven. This Bible is a shadow of the word that is in heaven, the more sure word. We have the more sure word. Just like there's an ark up there, there's an ark down here, there's a temple up there, there's a temple down here. So if something down here is improper, then the one up there is going to have to be improper too because what's down here is a mirror of what's up there. So now you're saying God is a liar. That makes you a heretic. Heretics have condemnation waiting for them. If you want to be so presumptuous as to say the Bible has been improperly translated after God promises over and over again, I will preserve my word. You have a problem. Okay, uh, we just read Psalms 12, 6, and 7. Matthew 5, 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all is fulfilled. This word will stand all the way through to the white throne judgment. And people who are standing there are going to argue with God. Oh, but your word was wrong on this point. Uh, hold on. Uh, you have a Bible? See, because I want to see this. No, I don't have one with me, Lord. I just came from hell. You know, I got called up here. I got one. He's going to take that out. and He's going to say, here it is. Show me. Because I wrote that word. I know what's in it. And all the men who did their part and wrote too are going to be sitting there looking at him going, Go ahead, say something about my work. I wrote in that book too. If they were in a bad neighborhood, they'd be about to catch a beating. See, it doesn't work the way you want it to work. It doesn't work the way they want it to work. It only works one way, and it's God's way. And he said, and we've read this over and over already, but we still got more to go through, my word shall stand regardless of what you do or think. My word shall stand regardless of what human history does. It'll stand regardless of what man does. And as hard as man has tried to misinterpret God's word, the story still comes through. Any version of the New International Version Bible that comes after 1989 is missing a ton of verses. 
funny enough, if you go read it, the story still comes through. They attempted to corrupt it, the story still came through. It's amazing, because it's God working. Now, I don't recommend that Bible. I recommend if you want an NIV, get one that's older. Because those verses are there. That's just me. Now, there's some other ones. There's some other ones that, that people have written. The actual Bible that they translated to make it suit their needs. And funny enough, the story still passes through in that one, too. So as hard as man tries to corrupt the Bible and make it wrong, it's not wrong. And, and it is to me, it is a glaring insult. And, it, and it's, it's literally the person spitting in God's face to say that Satan, by black magic, corrupted the word of God. You are now saying Satan is more powerful than God. God is omnipotent. Satan is playing checkers while God is playing three-dimensional chess. He cannot change the word of God. It is impossible. To say that is to call God a liar, and that makes you a heretic. We read John 1, or, uh, yeah, John 1. Psalm 119, 127, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Why do they love the word so much? Because it was true and they believed it. Not like what these other people are doing. Now let me get my e-sword ready. We're going to go to Hebrews 4. But we're going to read something else first. We're on God Questions. Is the doctrine of preservation biblical? The doctrine of preservation in regard to Scripture means that the Lord has kept His Word intact as to its original meaning. Notice He said, didn't say original wording, original meaning. Preservation simply means that we can trust the Scriptures because God has sovereignly overseen the process of transmission over the centuries. As hard as a man would try to sit down and rewrite that Bible to corrupt it on purpose, God will make sure it comes out the way he wants it to and every single attempt that has happened has failed and i think it's hilarious because he takes man's supposed self-imposed and self-influenced knowledge and he takes it and turns it on its head so you can think whatever you want but you're wrong god is right let every man be a liar at the same time we must also be aware that we do not possess the original writings autographs now at the writing of this Actually, in a lot of cases, we do have the original writings now. God has been bringing that up because we're so close to the end. Let's see, when was this? Let's see if this gives a date of when it was posted. It does not. Okay. Um, what we do have are thousands of manuscripts from which the original writings can be ascertained. By thorough examination and comparison of those manuscripts, it is determined what the original writing stated. Now, right away, what people will say, well, well these men made mistakes. Because they were going out there and they were doing all these things and, and they got confused and they messed up because they're fallible. So when you tell me that you know about something and, and you're going to do that and I should trust you because you know what you're talking about, you're fallible because you're a man and I shouldn't trust you. So when you tell me that the word of God is inaccurate, I should just not trust you because you're fallible just like those men were. Yeah, see, it applies to you too. It's arrogance is what it is. Arrogance and narcissism. By thorough examination and comparison of those manuscripts, it is determined what the original writing stated. This does not mean that there are absolutely no differences between the manuscripts. But the differences are extremely small and insignificant and do not in any way affect the basic teachings or meanings of God's word. The Watch, I'll show you. The differences are like minor spelling error variations. When they sat down and they counted all of the issues they found, and all of them were grammatical, between all the writings, it was just grammatical issues. What they found was, is that when you open your Bible up, the amount in all of this, in all the writings put together, the amount was half of one side of one page. That's it. And they were all grammatical. It did nothing to the story at all. It was all half of one page. One side of one page. That's it. That's all there was. And none of it affected the story in any way, shape, or form. It was a misspelled word, but they could see the word and go, okay, we know what this word is by the context. And they would find a bunch of other writings that would prove that. We should keep in mind that this would not and does not affect the accuracy of Scripture, nor does it mean that God has not preserved His Word. God has supernaturally kept or preserved His, his Word. I'm going to make a bold statement here. These people that believe this are unsaved. Because if they were saved, they would know better. 
They can deny it all they want. They can get mad all they want. I don't care. The fact of the matter is, you cannot say you are a saved, born-again believer and sit there and tell God to his face, ah, oh, your words are improperly translated. You made a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. The early scribes whose jobs were to make exact copies of Scripture were very meticulous. Not only would one of them do it, but others would check their work. One example of their scrupulous precision is the practice of counting all the letters in a given book and noting the middle letter of the book. They would then do the same for the copy to make sure it matched. They employed such time-consuming and painstaking methods to ensure accuracy. So what they would do is they would count all the letters to the very center of the letter of the, of the writing and see what letter was there. And then they would compare all of them to see if it came up. That was one of the ways they used, just one. Further, we can take note of the following verses that demonstrate God's plan to preserve his word. In Matthew 5.18, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. We read that one. In this verse, Jesus declared that not even the smallest stroke of a letter in the Hebrew alphabet would pass away until all is accomplished. He couldn't make that promise unless he was sure that God would preserve his word. Notice this was New Testament, not Old, which it included the Old Testament. He's talking about the whole entire book. Jesus also said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Matthew 24, 35, Mark 13, 31. Luke 21, 33. That's one great marker about how you can know those letters are true. That was one of the indicators they used back then. Is this statement true in this letter? Is it true in this letter? Is it true in this letter? Have they changed? Well, we, can, we can go from there. Jesus again affirms that God's word will not pass away. God's word will remain and accomplish that which God has planned. If Jesus in John 1 is the word and the word cannot pass away, Jesus didn't pass away, did he? No, he didn't. He, was, he rose again. The prophet Isaiah, through the power of the Holy Spirit, stated that God's word would remain forever. The grass withers, the flower, uh, flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Isaiah 40, verse 8. We read that. This was reaffirmed in the New Testament when Peter quoted the same passage and referred to it as the word that was preached to you. This is in 1 Peter 1, 24-25. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Neither Isaiah nor Peter could make such statements without the understanding of God's preservation of Scripture. We should keep in mind that when the Bible speaks of God's word remaining forever, it cannot be referring to it being kept hidden away in some vault in heaven, which a lot of them try to say to cover their backside, instead of just being an adult and admitting they're wrong. One of the greatest things you can ever do between you and God is admit when you're wrong and accept what his truth says. God's word was given specifically for mankind, and it would not be fulfilling its purpose if it were not available to us. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Well, if you don't believe the word of God is properly translated, how are you going to get any encouragement from it? Are you self-encouraging? That's narcissism. That's pride. That's heresy. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Also note that a person cannot be saved apart from the gospel message. You cannot be saved apart from the gospel message. You cannot be saved apart from the gospel message. Otherwise, you don't know what you believe in or who you believe in. So to say the word of God is improperly translated is to shed a negative light and shadow onto that gospel message, which means you're a heretic, which means you're not saved, which means you are condemned. Because nobody with that type of mentality can enter into heaven, because this whole book is about it. Which is recorded in God's word in 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. What scriptures? Oh, the scriptures that you say are improperly translated? Oh, that's a problem now, isn't it? That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So you've got to change everything you understand about this in order to make it valid. To make what you say true. Which makes you even more of a liar. Which makes you even more of a heretic. Which makes you even more condemned. Because now you're just continually spitting in God's face. 
telling him you know better than he does. Well, that's wrong. Therefore, in order for the gospel message to be proclaimed to the ends of the earth, in Acts 13, 47, for so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That would mean this word would have to travel throughout the ends of the earth. Do you see any apostles running around in, in sheepskins and staffs and sandals preaching the gospel to people? No. How has the gospel spread around the world? The, what they'll tell you is, well, the Holy Spirit did it. How did they know about the Holy Spirit? How did they just not think it was just some, something that was crazy? Oh, that guy's crazy. He's got a demon. He's got a spirit in him. Oh, wait. They did that to Jesus until he proved who he was with the word, the word they knew. The word you say is improperly translated. Hello? you got a huge problem here. The doctrines and truths of the word must be protected. If scripture were not supernaturally preserved, there would be no way to ensure the consistency of the message it contains. It is impossible for you to say that you were saved if you don't have these scriptures. Now, you can go into other places where the Bible has never been, and you can see that there's an understanding of a creator, great spirit, holy spirit. You can see that this understanding exists because heaven itself or, I'm sorry, nature itself, creation itself, shows men that there's a creator. Even in the darkest jungles, these men have an understanding of this. Now, what you'll find is they worship other gods because they haven't associated all things with that god, but they do know he's first. When you take the Bible in and say, that god that you believe in, that creator, this is him. This book was written about him. They believe just like that. They understand now because they have a focal point. There is no way any of those people could have any access to Christ and salvation if this book had not been taken to them. So to say this book has been improperly translated is to call God a liar. If you're calling God a liar, that makes you a liar, and it makes you a heretic, and it makes you condemned. Good luck. We're going to close on Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful, and the King James is living and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The reason why these people attack the scriptures is because it does exactly what it says it does here in Hebrews 4.12. It discerns the intents and the thoughts of their hearts, that they are evil, that they are disgusting, that they don't seek the good of those that believe, that they don't seek the uh, preservation of worship and thanksgiving to God. It only serves their own purposes. And so because it does that, they have to shed as much negative light on it as they can. And they were the first one to pull that Bible out and hold it in the air, but they're the last ones that are going to stand before God and have to give an account for what they did and what they said. They're the first ones to be out there going, ah, 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 and they're chanting and jumping up and down, hollering and screaming, hitting people in the head, but they're the last ones that are going to stand before God and everybody gets to see. Okay, bring in the last group. At the White Throne Judgment, bring in the last group. All right, who are all these? These are the ones that said your word was a lie, that it was improperly translated. And you know what? God's going to sit up in his throne and go, Ooh, really? All of you think? Who's got an argument now? Because now you're looking at me. Now you're talking to me. By the way, meet my son. This is the author of that book. So he would know better than anybody whether that book was properly translated or not, since he was the one that oversaw its translation. These are all the people that I commissioned to do that very work. Who are you going to disagree with now? Because all the people who know the facts are sitting here. State your case. Stop. Go. You're out of here. There's no argument. There's no stating a case. You have no case. Either it's true or it's not true. If it's true, shut up. Believe what the word says and walk on into salvation. If it's not true... We're all doomed because our faith is nothing. If the scriptures are not correct, our faith is worthless and we are all destined for darkness and nobody has salvation because nobody knows the right way to get to God. But luckily we have the true translated scriptures that tell us the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. That salvation is in him and belief in his name. And that when we do and we are regenerated and changed, 
all truths will be revealed to us if we would but ask. And then over our lifetime, he will sanctify us up to the day of redemption when we will have the work finished in us that he started. But every single person that does not believe any of that, and if you don't believe one part of it, you don't believe any of it. You can't say, well, I believe this, but I don't believe this, and think you're okay. That's not true. Same, remember the dynamite. Well, I, I believe it's, it'll blow stuff up. I don't believe any of the rest of it. Boom. As soon as you pick it up. A friend of mine got a, I got a hold of some sticks of dynamite one time. And he set them in a five-gallon bucket with a bunch of water got in there. There was about that much water in the bottom of that five-gallon bucket. And them sticks were in there. So they went in there, and he took the sticks out and put them in another bucket full of water and got them out of the way. Well, they didn't know what they were going to do with that nitroglycerin. He could have just dumped it on the ground. It would have been fine. Well, his bright idea was to put a couple of wires in there and step back and touch a 9-volt battery to it to see what would happen. Because it was all water, but it was full of nitro because it sweated. His son was standing close to it. Now, this is an unsealed, uncapped five-gallon bucket. The explosion was so powerful, and he was standing 30 feet away. The explosion was so powerful, it almost ripped his clothes off him. It literally almost blew his clothes off his back. Damn it. Darn near killed him. So he took the rest of that stuff and did away with it, buried it. If you don't heed the warnings, bad things are going to happen. If you don't listen to the entire word... Problems are going to happen. You, I can't even begin to tell you how many people riding down the road, talking on their phone, and they got a $1,000 stereo in that dashboard that will connect to Bluetooth so they can drive hands-free, and they won't do it. And when you bring it up to them, well, I don't know how to do that. Have you opened your glove box? Because there's a really cool book in there called Owner's Manual, and it tells you how to do it. It only takes a minute. Hey, how do I get saved? I don't know. A lot of people say a lot of different things. Hey, isn't there like a book or something like that? Yeah, but they said that's been improperly translated. Well, so what are we supposed to do? Well, I guess just make it up. See, when you do that with the Bible, you now get to make up whatever you want. And again, no two people agree. No two agree. You set them down together and have them talk it out, and they'll agree, 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 and all of a sudden here comes a disagreement, and then they start fighting, then they start yelling, and then they don't talk to each other anymore. And the funny thing is, is both of them are going to the same place, so they'll spend, get to spend eternity, if they don't change, standing there looking at each other going, man, we were both wrong. Well, it's too late now, because by the time you realize you made a mistake, it's too late, and you can't change what happens. You can't change the location. You can't be down there going, oops, my mistake, uh, hey, uh, a little help. Just like what Abraham said to the rich man, I couldn't come to you if I wanted to. There's a great gulf that's been fixed between us. Sorry. You made a mistake. And it cost you everything. And once that door shuts, that's it. It's a done deal. You had better figure it out now. If somebody is listening that's in that boat that has that mentality, you better get it right now. If you don't get it right now, and, and how do you get it right? Read the word. Accept what it says. And if it tells you to change, if it convicts you, change. Do what his word says. But if you keep walking around with that mentality of, I'm better than everybody else because I have the greater understanding, because I spent so many years of my life studying this, which is absolutely ridiculous because you can spend a thousand years studying this book and still never understand it completely. The only understanding you can get that's worth anything comes from the Lord, but you've got to ask him for it. And then when he brings it, don't change it. It's like taking a comic book story about Superman and changing the words to say the way that he's not, he, he, he doesn't uh, succumb to kryptonite. Okay, well, you mess the story up because now he's completely impervious to everything. Well, it's a boring story. He's going to win every time. He's got to at least have some kind of weakness. That's why they put that in the story. All this stuff is in this book for a reason. Every single word. And when we stand in the kingdom, we're going to find that out. And he's going to show us how important every single word is. Now, some of us are going to have some misunderstandings and some disagreements on things. That's okay. He, he knows that. He's going to teach us all that. 
But if you're completely against the word of God, but you're holding that Bible out there, using it as a weapon to beat people up, using that as an excuse to hate on other people. Well, first of all, the Bible says no murderer. And Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. No murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So there's another check mark against you that you're a heretic and you're condemned. All these people that are doing this, all these people that have this hard, hardcore mentality, I'm King James only, every other Bible's wrong. You do know there were six other Bibles before the King James, right? You do know the King James was interpreted loosely off of them too, right? Well, the King James fixed what they said, really, because there's some stuff in the King James that should have been left alone. Funny enough, when they changed those words, the story still kept going and the proper understanding still kept going. See, this is what I like about Hebrews 4.12, because that word discerns who's going to do it and who's not. Because the person who really wants it is going to have the right understanding. The person who doesn't is going to have the wrong. The person who's condemned is going to have the wrong. The person who is trying to look out for themselves and glorify themselves is going to have the wrong. But the one who truly wants to serve God will have the right. That's how you know who you're dealing with. Do not accept anything anybody tells you. Test it. Don't accept anything I tell you. Test it. Don't believe me. I'm a man. I'm fallible. Test it. This book's been tested. This book has been tested over and over and over again. And the more we look at it, the more accurate it becomes. So for any person out there, if you ever run into anybody that ever says this, if any of you people are listening that do this, it is a grave error and very much brings a, 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 a intense concern and an intense reaction to help you understand the truth. And if you don't want the truth, you've been warned and your blood is on your own hands. There will be no blood on mine. This word is, act, is accurate. This word has been proven accurate. Not as the word goes, but as what God intended the message to be. And the message will always be the same. It will never change, no matter what man does to this book. How do I know? God said he would do that. He said he would preserve his word. This word will last forever. So, if this is where your stance is, good luck. You've been warned. If any of you know the truth and you run into people like this, tell them the truth. Show them the truth. I gave you the scriptures. But don't ever let them convince you otherwise. Because to do that puts you in the error with them. What happens when somebody brings you another Jesus? Because when they say this kind of stuff, they're, they're technically bringing you another Jesus. What does the Bible say? Don't have anything to do with them. Don't even greet such a one. Don't even let them in your house. Because they're going to bring that heresy in with them. And all it takes is one bad bolt to bring the whole vehicle down and cause it to wreck. Ask anybody who's had their suspension fall off because of improper maintenance. One nut, one bolt can bring the whole vehicle down. All right. Love you guys. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.